Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, I wanted to just today in this OCP HPC sub project meeting, I wanted to cover uh, the OCP regional summit presentation that I'm pulling together. Uh, I had to put a draft in last yesterday, uh, so I've done that, um, but I'm still I'm still tweaking that as we go. And so I just wanted to go through that. Um, I guess what I'm doing there is I, I ha I'm trying to avoid just a, a repeat of the OCP Global Summit's uh, presentation. So I'm, I'm only given a very brief uh, uh, overview of the module, but from a slightly different perspective. And I'm referring people back to last October's uh, presentation to get a get a more detailed overview, and then I'm focusing on uh, the thermal uh, design or idea, <laughs> and the um, uh, and the uh, it, the interconnect, the universal interconnect. So I wanted to expand on that, and I wanted to maybe just uh, get some feedback, uh, especially on the the thermal one is is somewhat out there. <laughs> It's based on a lot of discussions, uh, a lot of good discussions we've had. I have no idea whether it has any potential of working, so I'm stating that quite clearly, but that's where we want some support. It's, I think it has a radical nature and it probably is fundamentally flawed. But uh, so if you can, if any, any experts here can steer me in the right direction there, then uh, that would be useful. Uh, so, so we've got a couple more join. Uh, hi, Randy and Jason. Hi, how are you? Jason? Yeah, thanks. Let me just capture you a minute. Okay. All right, let me uh, share my screen. Okay, let me just, uh, over here, just update. This was the new attendees. Okay, so again, for those of you that weren't on the last call, uh, this is the headline of the presentation, Progress Towards an Open and Sustainable Energy-Centric Computing Architecture for Today's AO and HPC Applications. And uh, as, as, as I've said here, uh, that we are going to focus on the two areas, as I just mentioned. Actually, I've said power and thermal infrastructure, so uh, I need to probably add a little bit on the power, uh, which wow. would be good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll add a bit on the power side. That did cross my mind. And the second was on the universal interconnect. So here's a presentation as we stand right now. Uh, so I'll put it in full presentation mode. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, thanks. Yes. So, as I mentioned, this is the, uh, I'll, I'll just skim through this, but uh, so so the we're going to cover just this high level view from a sort of a system down perspective. Uh, then I'm going to dive into this uh, uh, efficient direct water cooling architecture with energy and recovery and reuse and then a universal interconnect support and migration with copper CPO. So I've pulled this one. I did this when I presented to Oak Ridge National Lab. So I, I wanted to, I'm still working on how, how I explain the words here, but I wanted to sort of zoom in from a, <laughs> from a system level down to where we are with the module. And uh, on the left is a picture of the Frontier supercomputing infrastructure layout. 
uh, and uh, basically I worked out effectively how many HPCM modules you would need uh, to create the same setup with our with our approach, and then built a little model of uh, of walls of compute uh, with the modules plugged in, and just got some statistics there from the uh, calculation of the relative foot footprint compared to frontier, um, and uh, the fact that you have a you have the potential for a lot more powering and cooling density uh, with this approach as well that compared to that set up if you can get the power into the infrastructure in the first place <laughs> uh, so then i i just sort of say hey look this is built up by these little modules so i zoom out one one module in the in that infrastructure and then uh we start to i i, I give a very brief overview again i don't i don't go into any of the details here we, i've literally got 10 well it's 15 minute allocation we've got uh, and that includes transition time, which they're saying is like two to three minutes and, and Q&A. So I've probably got in the region of 10 to 12 minutes for this presentation. So I'm going to, this is where I just, just talk very briefly. Uh, people often misinterpret how big this is. So I, I realize that an EU brick size uh, uh, is a nice little comparison. I think it's fairly similar to a US brick size. And um uh, in terms of the brick in the wall <laughs> analogy, uh, I thought that was quite amusing. Maybe bring some Pink Floyd, another brick in the wall uh, music in here if we didn't have to pay the royalties. <laughs> uh, so I'm just saying this is all about composability for so you can construct any domain specific architecture. This uh, size wise, at least it's in, in, in you know, processor wise, it's inspired by the OEM module. Uh, we can support any processor accelerator switch, uh, less than a kilowatt maximum power as, as we've architected it so far. Uh, support 16 of the E3S memory or media modules uh, with uh, universal interconnect topology, eight times, uh, eight, eight interconnects for topology IO. And uh, based on some calculations with the Avicenna uh, uh, optics approach, we can potentially get eight terabytes per second of off off uh, off module bandwidth, which is you know in the region uh, of, of of the direction of where HBM is going. So to be a one to one with HBM would be absolutely fantastic. Uh, so, and this is scalable, and this is where I bring in this point with it. We're scalable from from the HPC to the edge. In reverse, or maybe I should say it from the edge to HPC. Uh, so, so this is where I, I I next bring up. So I've, I'm I'm going to have some more animation here with the with the help of Chat GPT. I managed to put a, a telecom box into a Lisbon uh, a sidewall, uh, except for it's not exactly on the side. But this is what Chat GPT came up with. So I was going to populate the internals of this with a mini wall with a number of modules in it. And so we could say, you know, you could construct, you could construct a wall uh, at the edge uh, in, a, in a, like a telecom box. We'd have power and water coming from underneath, and uh, the the likes of um, uh, like, so like my hometown in Bristol, England, has something called the Bristol Heat Network. So it has hot water running throughout the city. It gets fed into buildings. So you know, the the, the heat from this this unit could be feeding into the into the heat network. And so that's showing an edge implementation there. Uh, and then I've got, uh, again, courtesy of ChatGPT, I've managed to create this little, this little uh, uh, image of, of somebody's garage. The HVAC unit isn't quite right, but <laughs> uh, there's a few little anomalies in these pictures, but it gave me a nice little wall here and I was gonna populate maybe four modules on the wall there and you know say this can be plumbed into the hvac hot your hot water system and your hvac system if it was designed into a house and uh instead of having your children's gaming pc boiling their bedroom uh with a, a kilowatt pc uh these days uh they you know you, you could you could basically buy your buy your gaming engines your, your compute and your compute plug it into the uh 
into your into your wall in your garage and you you're off to the races there as well so the idea is is instead of all this masses of different types of servers for embedded you know embedded in all the different ones this this approach is is potentially uh adaptable to these these uh, edge applications as well so that's that was what I was going to cover in those is is to try and give the bring a sort of slightly different perspective of the use case of this this module and I believe that personally, from an EU perspective, they are much more um, uh, sustainable aware. It's like a priority for them. I think you can't even build a new uh, high performance compute, a new data center of more than a megawatt without actually reusing at least 10% 10, 10 of the energy uh, you, 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 uh, you consume. And uh, they're also quite a bit more organized in terms of bringing uh, policy uh, where, where, you know, some you know, standardization. I, mean, I think a great example is like USB-C. We had all these plug-in adapters and even EU even have forced Apple to come and join the party of, of, of everybody having this one interconnect for our mobile power and data connection for our mobile devices. So they're probably in a better position to, to make some of this a reality. Uh, and and so I guess I'm hoping that we can get a little bit more involvement from, from Europe by, with this presentation. So that's part of this motivation. And, and, and by the way, last October, I actually did present in my hometown in Bristol, not this presentation, but I, I, I did talk to about the, talk to them about uh, you know infrastructure planning and all the rest of it in in building codes could potentially be adapted so it was it was it was a city uh um it was a a, a government city uh event called the Bristol Tech Festival that I that I presented out there this is where it gets interested and this is where the experts in the room are going to say that, that I'm a complete idiot so uh, I've got the I've got the uh, comment at the bottom, unproven, hypothetical concept only. Um, but based on the 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 very interactive work stream discussions we've been having on the thermal side and and a bit broader as well, and a little bit more research uh, based on that, I've I've come up with this uh, hypothetical uh, implementation. So for those of you that remember, we have uh, each column is eight HPM, HPCMs tall, and we have the pipe work, a, a closed loop for each of those eight modules. And at the top, we exchange that, we have a heat exchanger to exchange that with facility water. So I've tried to draw the diagram in here is, is how I would see this being created. Uh, so at the top, if we talk at the top, we've got the facility water coming in. And that there's a control valve on the flow of that that is controlled by the outlet temperature of that. Again, this is with regards to energy reuse perspective. So I've just gave, given an example of 60 degrees C plus for the water coming out, out there. And um, that heat exchanger is then the, the top of the, of the loop of the column of eight HPCM modules. We were talking about, so there's a couple of things of, uh, in here. First of all, we've, we, we were discussing two phase. We've been discussing using water um, as a medium and to get, uh, oh, to get water. Um, in fact, there was a guy called John Summers from the RISE Institute of Sweden, the Research Institute of Sweden called RISE. Uh, there was asking questions around the use of water at last year's regional summit, uh, as opposed to dielectrics. And it was quite an interesting set of questions he had, he asked. And so in speaking to him, I got a little bit more educated on the, on the, on the water approach versus dielectric. And um, if we pull a vacuum in, in, a, it, it, with water, uh, and you go down to, let's say, 0.2 bar, or roughly 0.2 of an atmosphere. Uh, I understand, again, from uh, one of our members, I think Peter, uh, who's not on today, I don't think, uh, that we can pull 
um, water will boil at a lower temperature, around 60 or 65 degrees C. And so therefore we can put this into a two phase operation. Now the question is begged as how do we pull a vacuum inside this loop? And I, after doing a bit of research, uh, I've, I understand that these liquid ring vacuum pumps are, are, are quite effective at pulling a, a relatively, so 0.2 bar is a relatively low, you know, not, not that challenging of a vacuum to pull compared to whatever vacuum pumps can potentially pull. And uh, it can also be mixed with water. So we could have, and this is one area where I'm not sure if this is going to work. <laughs> Uh, but if we actually have in the loop, you have a mixture of a certain percentage, let's say 80% of water in, and 20% and, and is, is some inert gas, maybe air, maybe maybe something more, you know, uh, less volatile or whatever. Um, uh, and, uh, and so that will keep the, that, 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 that means we're plumping the fluid around still, hopefully. And that again, the design of that is really where I'm out of my depth. So this is one of the big, big questions. Uh, but assuming that will help us to pull the vacuum, uh, my understanding is that a you know two phase is about seven times more efficient than single phase. Again, based on discussions in this group, and so that's that's quite a big leg up in terms of the ability to cool these hot devices, and then. I've expanded one little picture of an HPCM module showing a, a, a valve on the input side flowing through the veins of the uh, of the manifold where we plug in the media and the active cables that were where they were going to be cooling directly with a conduction cord, uh, and then that water flows up into the into the top uh, where we have the kilowatt processor and we have an, an immersion cooled processor. Uh, up there using the ideas from um, from the UIUC, University of Illinois, where, where they're talking about conformally coating the copper uh, with, with copper over the module. And uh, that's about seven times more efficient in a power per unit volume of copper. So when you compare it to a copper heat sink, so that might mean that we can we can get get a, get away with with a, a less uh, less copper in terms of the for for the transfer to the to the water or or we just get seven x better for the same amount of copper. Then uh, we have a separate little closed loop control on the water, so the water that ejects from each module is is at a at a programmed return temperature of again I've said sixty five degrees C, so. That controls the inlet valve. So depending on the power being burnt in the HPCM module, then you obviously need a, a, a greater or lesser flow across the module. Uh, when the uh, big processor is, is obviously uh, running hot, it will the temperature will rise. And when it hits, assuming it rises with the flow of water across it, uh, and that the water is not sufficient to to cool it, then we'll get to a boiling point of 65 C, where suddenly we'll get a seven X improvement in the uh, extraction of the heat. So again, that's probably going to be uh, an interesting way of how does that work? How do we control that? Um, and do we start to increase the flow rate? Because if you turn it back into uh, non-boiling water then the efficiency of the heat transfer drops dramatically. So how do you balance that control loop? Uh, so that's an interesting one. And then uh, I've just shown at the bottom that then we can we repeat that circuit in parallel for up to eight HPCMs in the, in the column. So that's the basic block diagram. Um, and then uh, another point to make is the reason for using water is water is actually four to nine times better from a thermal conductivity perspective than this PO, PA0 or fluorinate, um, which are two examples that were given in, in a paper that Boyd put forward. 
So if you multiply these in, these efficiencies together, if, if I've got this right, and I may be wrong about this multiplication effect, but seven times seven times four is 200. Um, so it's 200 times or more improvement over conventional liquid co cooling techniques. Um, now, obviously other liquid cooling techniques often, sometimes they use water, sometimes they don't, you know, depend on immersion. Uh, so, so my argument here is this sounds too interesting not to be explored as a, as a potential avenue. And it could well be, and probably is fundamentally flawed. <laughs> so uh, the call there is for, hey, we need help. So any any uh, experts on the call here to who jump in and tell me that, that what's what's wrong and what's right with this? Well, it's it's not a linear function, uh, Alan. But one of the biggest issues that or opportunities. So the EHPC has been looking at this um, for, from multi aspect, including you know the cooling, the the power, and um, just starting at kind of at the power point. Um, if we look at, we were just reviewing some of the data on on the top five hundred power measurements, and the power measurements are all over the place in in terms of of what that actually means. So there's some assumptions that go just from the power perspective that um, are, are still quite gray, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that, of course, then it has to do with what's the overall uh, benefits. In terms of immersion, one of the biggest, one of the reasons you're not seeing um, buildings convert to, convert to immersion, one of the challenges, one of the opportunities is the, the, the physical weight when you start to talk about it. Because the weight, exactly. the weight of water is just the, the building would crumble if you tried to go to to liquid cooling. So that's that's why um, brown fields and green fields uh, have two two different paths in terms of trying to look at it. The the when we did the um, birds of feather session down at SC twenty three last year on cooling, one of the things that came out of that and this is my my from my perspective only uh, based on all the engagement of about, I think there's about 80 people, is that um, immersion cooling is going to be a very, very small uh, select application because the, the cost, the investment, because um, the, when you start to get into the maintenance aspects of this, the maintenance aspects can go up dramatically. Um, and there's just not enough of it right now to understand what that actually is. But that was one of the biggest concerns expressed um, from numerous people is, is it was far more costly than a couple of people that did a small scale, far more costly in terms of maintenance and what, what they you know, thought it would be. So there's, there's just that aspect of it. Now, the, the, we're looking at this chart right here. There's some efficiency um, opportunities. Um, 0.2 bar and get into minus 65, that's assuming an idealized system. And, and that may not be the case. So there's there's um, a point well taken in, in the slides, which I, I like, um, but there's there's a lot of, of it depends that go back inside of here. Fundamentally, water people want to use water, but there's there's issues. You don't use water because of corrosion and, and other uh, compatibility. Oh, just on that, I do have that water use concerns, but yeah, so I do have a slide on the water use. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, that that is the biggest because that also then begins to affect the reliability and cost of the of the of the coolant itself. So there's a number of different aspects. Um, like I say, in the the EHPC has been looking at a number of these, um, and you know it's got it's interesting because we we got industry and national labs that are contributing um, a lot of information. So I just wanted to share that as a kind of the starting point. Yeah, the EHPC is is good. That's Natalie Bates, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, no, that's no that, that what they're doing with that document. In fact, it, that's I should I should pull that one into this presentation. Actually, I I think I think because yeah, they're they're trying to encourage people to to follow that document, right? And, yeah, uh, it's not a rule yet. Yeah, we and, we, and what, what I'm trying to say, go on. go ahead. No, no, I I, I was just I, all I was going to say was. Um, 
uh, I, I think everything we do here should we, we should be taking guidance from that document. So we, we're a clean sheet of paper. That guidance, that that document is looking for it, it, things from that, uh, you know, from from the clean sheet sustainable perspective, and uh, and and so we have an opportunity to try and bring every recommendation uh, into this, if poss into this architecture, if possible. The, the, yeah, I, I would. I, that's where I was kind of going. Is there some really nice complementary work I think would would truly benefit this? Um, you know, one of the things we started talking about, and we gave this at at uh, um, the conference in Japan a couple of years ago is there's there's static and dynamic, but then there's also transient in terms of the powers and what that actually kind of needs that puts on the system. Because a lot of these HPC solutions, uh, specific to HPC, the transients of are just too great for any UPS system to be able to handle. So when it goes down, it goes down because of a transient. And, and that can be, you know, uh, uh, storms in, in the people in Idaho National Lab actually experienced this um, a couple of years ago when there was a lightning storm um, that, that passed nearby that disrupted their power. And there was I, 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 think, I think it might have been you when I was on one of the calls that, uh, you, you know, the, the amazing fact that, that the, uh, the load or the dynamic load of a data center and the impact it has on the grid when you're pulling 10 megawatts <laughs> Is uh is is was quite an education for us when I heard that. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, I always, whenever INL posts their, you know, their their new portable uh, reactor, I say, okay, data center people are just eager and waiting for them, so <laughs> they, they couldn't come fast enough. Exactly, exactly. No, um, uh, no, that's that's very good. No, no, thanks for bringing that up. I, I, I mean, yeah, I. I think I will. I'll, I'll think I'll add a slide in in there for. In fact, let me just let me just make a note of it here. Let me just put it in. Yeah, there may be people here that aren't familiar with the, with the um, commissioning. Um, and like I say, we, we we just redid that, and that was brought out in the supercomputing the birds of feather. So that may be also um, some exercises because we're looking at this at a you know kind of a holistic perspective. Um, and as an aside, I was in a I heard a presentation from the IEEE PES, and there were some people that were making comments that some of these data centers, well, not not only are transformers, there's supply chain uh, opportunities related to transformers being unavailable, and so they can't add power where they want to. But um, one of the things that they're looking at is how do we start to make that much power available to some of these locations, and even if you look at um, in, in some of these edge, because potentially you might want to move those into, you know, an existing uh, site and the power requirements can be pretty dramatic and they just don't have a way of, of bringing new power in at a, at a viable cost. Right, right. But um, thanks for this information. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's good. Thanks. Um, so, uh, well, so... I mean, just on that, by the way, I don't know. So, so Randy, you've been in and out of a few of these meetings, but we're we're trying to get a proposal together for uh, the DOE Oak Ridge National Lab's new frontiers um, funding when that when that RFP eventually comes out. But I've always wondered on the energy efficiency side and sustainability side whether whether those would be better funding avenues because because. We need innovation from the ground up thinking about this and, and it looks like those areas are saying what can we do to dramatically change the game uh, so what, one thing i also wanted to do to touch back on is when you're talking about immersion i completely agree with your your, your uh, discussion on it i mean and, that, and that's always been my point is that um we look at all of our industry today and we keep doing incremental evolutionary changes. It's like, oh, we need to cool these things. Immersion cooling would be a good idea. Let's just dip our server entirely into a puddle, into a pool of water, right? <laughs> it's like, that's that's the solution without breaking everything else. Whereas I'm not sure if you understand, but this immersion cooling here is, is a tiny, are you familiar with our module? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. this is a tiny amount of water in comparison to a swimming pool. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
um uh so so that that's the idea here is is um is where it can be it could be dramatically different and this is what I, i've been doing i've been listening to the experts for several years now and um and, and in fact trent de Hooge was on last week's call or a couple of weeks ago and he brought up what you did about the growth problems of water and uh and we had a separate call and he called in an expert that was one of the big supercomputers is saying you know the challenges they've had which has been an absolute nightmare with growth Mm -hmm. And uh, and the fact that this the, the, these um, bacteria grow in stagnant corners where you get a bit of turbulence in a stagnant area of water, yep. Yep. and you don't know until it breaks off. And because you've got such fine copper channels going through these heat sinks to get as much heat transfer as possible, they end up being more effective filters than the filters you put in <laughs> to capture these. And so you end up actually completely clogging up those areas. And so uh so so these these sort of other efficiencies we've got here is like we, we were arguing could you actually not make the channels so dense with your conformally coated copper approach or um you, you know or, or or the fact that we're actually they said that the bacteria love that the, the temperature of these loops mm -hmm. is the sweet spot of the bacteria right around mm -hmm. about 40 degrees yep. uh, c or whatever it is or 30 40 c uh, whereas if we operate up at this 65C, obviously we've got the complaints of the silicon people. But again, if you've got good thermal transfer, a low thermal resistance between the two, um, uh, then um, maybe we can operate this at 65C. Silicon has a normal 85C uh, operating maximum temperature and the industry is moving and has been for a decade or more to around 105C operating temperature. So a, a 65 degrees C return temperature doesn't seem uh, a, a, a problem. So would that would that stop bacteria growth? Now I did research on that. And we've also, uh, apparently you get some bacteria that are more than happy to grow in 80 degrees C water. <laughs> so oh, yeah. Yeah. would that situation- One just needs to go look at the at the pools in Yellowstone to see what's, what bacteria actually uh, actually grow in, in some Right, of right, right, exactly. So, so, and would the environment be there for that, or, or is it? And, and I guess that was my point. So, so here I've got this water concern, use concern slide. So, you know, water is electrically electrically conductive. Um, the idea of the conformal coating is that we could you would isolate that with an insulation layer first in the conformal coating process, a bit like the, the military cards have. But that's not necessarily a slam dunk either, because you could modify impedances of certain things or at 48 volts, would it flash across a, a very small coating layer? So we, you'd probably need some innovation there. Um, uh, yeah, dielectric, dielectric breakdown from a catastrophic or, or ionized potential can actually right. be, be right. very disruptive, yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, we uh, so bacterial growth. Can can you really design something that, where you eliminate the stagnant stagnant water areas? That's that, they said they were surprised. They had to literally IBM and the rest and dissect these things apart to find out where the bacteria was growing. You know, it was it was it was a surprise. So I mean, and the water temperature will that help? Maybe maybe not. My point is, water is so good. And it's so sustainable so from a sustainability and environmentally friendly perspective, it's absolutely fantastic compared to even treating water. You know, it, it's a case of why don't we put the research into saying, can we really overcome these challenges in a more uh, in a design way rather than we're finding out by accident as we build these systems at the moment? Corrosion is another issue in mixing of materials. I understand uh, it gives you this you know, this uh, electrical uh, you know, migration process. So, mm -hmm. so uh, mixed material issues. That how do we avoid corrosion? We could do water treatment, but that does reduce thermal conductivity, and we have the sustainability concerns of the of the water treatment as well. So, so, so yeah, this is something we definitely have to have to address with in, with in the, the corrosion aspect you know because you know that was always back in the aerospace days um you can build a you can build and treat materials but then just the normal assembly process uh you can inadvertently the operator can inadvertently create a compromise and 
and then you set yourself up for uh, a near-term failure, you know, that kind of changes the slope on the bathtub curve, if you will, of the, of the reliability. And then if, you, if, it's in the, if it's in the wrong point, then you can have a catastrophic where um, in your, your coolant gets, gets where you don't want it to. So there's, uh, you know, there's, there's the immersion has, like I say, um, especially two phase, it's going to have a clearly have a, a, a di distinct um, area where it, immersion is going to find a wonderful home. Um, but yeah, the, the material compatibility, I mean, that's where the proprietary is, is how much, how much non-water, what's the percentage of non-water? And that's what people won't really, or they. they yeah. Uh, so Blake, I think, uh, so Trent de Hooge was mentioning they use Blake Hall and it's about a 25% Blake or 75% water mix is, is, uh, is what they're using. In, in some cases. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because um, there, there's different e efficiencies, you know, that, that we've realized in coolings in terms of what the concentration is. And, and you can easily get 15, 20 percent with just a small percentage and change in terms of overall uh, thermal management effects. Right, right. So, uh, I mean, I, I, don't know, I don't know how much your experience goes or if there's anyone else on the thermal side of the core. I mean, does this look... I mean, I, 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 my naivety on this is is off the off the charts. I manage, so, but the thing is, is I love to do this, and then the experts tell you why it won't work, and then the experts can often solve some of these problems. <laughs> so it's I, I don't mind being seen being seen as the idiot if it if it really stimulates the experts to get involved and say, hang on, this could work, but you need to change this, that, and the other. Yeah, I think it highlights some some perhaps lower hanging fruit that that um, the industry hasn't paid sufficient attention to. So that's why I say I, I like having these types of conversations. Uh, you know, as a physicist, and I got to peel this way back and look at the details. But you know, it 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 stimulates conversation. I think that's a very good thing. So thanks. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do. Oh, another another thing is is when I draw this, and people have often said this to me, <laughs> is is. It is quite complex. You you need you've got control theory going on here, <laughs> and uh, and and how quick do we need the control loops and managing like the boiling point or whatever, and um, uh, and and we have these valves everywhere, which which everyone's going to say, well, that's that's going to be a reliability nightmare. Um, so you know, it's it's that that they're you know, it's, it, it's not without its issues either, right? But uh, so going in with the eyes open, but. Uh, yep. So, um, and then I was probably going to have, uh, I was going to work on an animation where I can actually show the module itself um, with the water flowing through it so people can get, a, 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 you know, this this little 2D image of the module. Obviously, people that don't know it, will, so they can see how it flows through the module and, you know, how, how little volume of water we actually need. Um, and as well, because the immersion is a little bit researchy for sure, and that we're, as I've said in the last uh, in the last call, I, I in terms of an application area, I'm really favoring uh, an FPGA emulation, ASIC emulation platform built with FPGAs. Uh, we I know that even these big FPGAs for ASIC emulation they're going to be in the sub 500 watt range, especially when they're running emulation. And so we don't necessarily need this elaborate capability to cool a kilowatt. And so we can, if I bring this, if I bring my 3D model over, uh, I, if just let me remove the wall a minute. Um, if we take this lid, Take the lid off. So, so this lid here, we can see we've got it as a little water immersion chamber here. Um, that's interesting. Something's changed about that. Oh, I see. Sorry. Let me try that again. Uh, if we take the lid, we've got a, 
uh, this is a little immersion area, um, but we can also design this lid so that it's just a water chamber with the same inlet and outlet, but the but we uh, then actually mount this uh, so that it mates with a thermal paste against the traditional, and we can do gap pads. So we could do a, a specially designed heat sink uh, for uh, a, a more traditional water cooling uh, uh, approach. So I'm thinking that we would do that first for the FPJ implementation. Uh, so, so again, the lid design. So, so I might show that as an as an option because we don't need to go to the extents of immersion cooling if if many of these processor modules are in the sub five hundred watt range, we should be fine. Um, uh, so, so, so that that was a way to sort of minimize the risk of the research area of conformal coating uh, in terms of as we as we make progress with the immersion implementation. So that's that. Um, uh, back to the slides. So just so that's that's a slide I need to need to add. Then uh, basically on the universal interconnects, I I've not really done much beyond what we've already talked about, uh, but I wouldn't mind doing a little bit more elaborate modeling work. So we've now decided that we're probably going to roll with the MCIO. Um, as a basis of a connector to roll with for this universal interconnect. And so I'm just highlighting, we want to be protocol agnostic, anything from PCI CXL to this 200 gig ethernet, we've got you know 200 gig per transceiver or MV link, XGMI, InfiniBand. We want to support everybody's IO with this connector design. Um, it's an eight lane based transceiver approach is what we normalize to. So, you know, from PCI Gen 5 speeds to top level Ethernet speeds is, is the range. You know, we want to cover all of this with one connector design. Uh, we want to be a little bit more advanced with the sidebands. So using some derivative or using LTPI to, 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 to push the sidebands uh, if needed across the cable. Plus we would add some clocks uh, and possibly one single pin for a cable present. So when, when we do discovery, we know that there is actually a cable plugged into all of these sockets when we're trying to see what's connected to what and see if the, we've got any, any broken connections. Um, uh, and then on the active, we need to support active optics and, and, and retimers. In fact, uh, uh, their, their retimers are being used. So, so I think, um, what's the retimer company? Uh, Astera Labs have just introduced their PCI Gen 6 retimers that are at like 11 watts for 16 lanes. So that means that we're in the five or six watts for for eight lanes. So, so that's, you know, if you see they're putting them in QSFP type cables, uh, huge. Whereas with this water, with a water cooled approach, we, we could easily put them in there. So I was going to try and do a little, there's an industry standard PCI retimer chip footprint for the Intel created. So I was going to make a little model of that, that retimer being on the paddle card so that we can show this. And maybe I can show it a versus a QSF PDD to show how dramatically smaller this would be if we could do that. Um, and uh, obviously, I, I was going to try and show the thermal path a bit more uh, to the uh, to the cold plate, so people can understand that part of this universal interconnect. And then there's a passive optical I/O where we where we've got, um, and I've just shown the Avicenna one that we've been using on our 3D models, where we could get four of these um, inside the, the the body of this of the MCIO connector in terms of a passive optical connection. So we'd, we'd be, be using the sort of same interconnect, interconnect approach, but for a passive optical where the co-packaged optics is on the motherboard. And um, in, in Avicenna's particular case, I think it's a terabit per link there for terabit transmit, terabit receive. Putting four of these into a connector gives you basically eight terabits or one terabyte per second per Per topology interconnect, so eight of these would be eight terabytes per second. 
um, and uh, that's uh, that's that's the HBM type bandwidths, which is great. Um, hi, Alan. Um, quick question. You know, since we are also a retimer vendor, um, and there is a PCIe optical uh, 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 subgroup in PCIe SIG. Yes. Um, so, are you? Do you, have you sort of shared this somewhere um, more? Uh, so I, I haven't, I'd love to, um, if, sure. if you could get me an invite, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm well aware of this. You're on about the CDFP, right? Um, Majid? Yes. Or, or I, I think, you know, the, the form okay. factors in PCIe SIG, you know, there, there are many, but uh, I think it's interesting. Your, your, uh, um, yeah, so that, that's it. If you look at, um, so light intelligence are building their own QSF PDD. But this this here, <laughs> this entire chip is like um, each one of these arrays are one millimeter in diameter, but the entire chip is like three millimeters by five millimeters, right? And it rattles around inside a huge QSFP cage, QSFP DD cage to get the eight lanes in uh, that you can put across here. And um, we can fit all this inside one one of these inside an active cable here and obviously the co-package we can fit the we can fit four of them on uh, underneath the connector here so um and with a conductive cooling we 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 don't have any issues with the power um and getting rid of the power and like so that that was my argument on last week's call out sorry if i'm repeating myself for some of you but but that we, we're we, we're we're now Nvidia have just announced the kilowatt B one hundred or whatever it's B two hundred, and uh, um, when you look at that, how power dense we're going with a thousand kilowatts for the size of an SXM module, and then you look at the size of a QSF PDD cage for what ten or twenty watts, <laughs> and then we're having to go to an OSFP cage uh, to 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 get to. Um, uh, to, you know, uh, as the powers go up, as we get to the 1.6 terabits or whatever it is per per eight length, uh, so it's 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 really quite interesting that the size of these these cages for I/O are actually almost as big as the modules for a, for a kilowatt processor. So <laughs> we need to catch up with the with the processor technology with the rest of our interconnect, etc. And this is how we could potentially do with this with some conductive cooling on active cables. Uh, so, so yeah, that's that's really what I'm emphasizing there. Um, and then, so in summary, you know, I said, look, we've got bold ambitions to bring our open computing architectures into the 21st century. And what I mean there is obviously you know, our, our classic server architecture. We need to catch up with the proprietary stuff that NVIDIA, Google, and Tesla, et cetera, are doing. So we really need to play catch up for the rest of us to play in this world. Uh, um, we need to have this sustainable energy centric computing first mindset. It's, it's really core to our vision. And I think that's where the Natalie Bates, the EHPC stuff comes, you know, front, left and center for us to help us drive this. Um, it requires innovation through collaboration across all of our industry silos, which is what we're trying to do. Uh, thermal management is a major challenge and we have some crazy ideas, <laughs> which we could do with help on. Uh, AI and HPC require system IO bandwidths that skyrocket, and we need to plan for this. And my, my argument there is we need to take a graceful approach to going from passive copper through active copper, active optical, near package optics, and, and co-packaged optics. And then we can we can more elegantly plan our journey as, as, as different systems move toward that. And really. Revolutionary change requires open collaboration. So thanks to OCP for allowing us to try and do this here. And then I, then we've got our regular call to action. So again, I said we need broad industry collaboration. We need everybody to come in and work together across the silos. Uh, I want help to for, me, for us to convert our naive thermal management concept into a reality and help us realize the universal interconnect that supports an evolving IO landscape. And there's our, our joining information. So that's that's basically the presentation I've got to do in, like I say, 10 minutes. <laughs> so we took a lot longer to go through it here. Um, any other comments on the interconnect or any other discussion points or what we should be high or what I should be highlighting?
Okay. Okay. Um, how about any other business? Is there any other topics anybody would like to raise? Okay, well, I'll give you a couple of minutes back then. Thanks very much, everybody. Hey, Alan, this is Randy. Yeah. So, so your, your meeting is adjourned. So this has been conflicting with another obligation, standards meeting obligation that I have. So that's why it's been challenging for me to uh, to join. So I'll, I'm, it may be coming to an end so I can uh, re get re-engaged here. Okay, great. All right, well, that'd be great. Thanks, Randy. And I appreciate yep. the input. Talk to you later. All right. Cheers. Bye. Thank you, Alan. That was a great. Have a good one, Alan. Thanks. Thanks.